In this video, I would like to introduce the concept of a DFT bin center frequency. And I'd like to uh, use some slides that have been prepared and are appear on the resources tab of our website, our class website. Um, I'm just going to walk through these uh, to introduce this idea. So to begin, let's assume we have this um, sequence x of n, which is a complex exponential sequence, and notice that its length is L, and the frequency is f naught. Let's calculate the dTFT, the discrete time Fourier transform, of this. Um, so that calculation is shown here. We plug the sequence in, multiply by the dTFT complex exponential, and sum from 0 to n minus, or L minus 1. If we combine the exponentials together into a single exponential, then we can use the geometric series formula to write down this expression, and we can express it as a periodic sync function in this form. So now what I'd like to do is look at a couple of special cases um, where we choose different values for the frequency f0. Um, recall that the dft is given as samples of the DTFT. And we'll assume in this case that capital N, the number of points in the transform, is greater than or equal to L, which is the length of the sequence. Yeah, so there's no zero padding in this case. So the first case I'd like to consider is the situation where F naught is equal to K naught divided by L, and we'll assume that um, n is equal to L. So this, is, this actually turns out to be one of these special bin center frequencies, where we have an integer divided by the length of the transform. And when we substitute this, uh, these variables in, so if we substitute f0 back into this expression here, notice that we get some cancellation with L and we end up getting this kind of a form. And if we do a little bit of analysis on this, we find out that this is always equal to zero for all values of k, um, except for when k is equal to k naught. So um, how did we get to this expression? One, one more time. What we did is we, we replaced f by k over n, and we replaced f naught by k naught over n and then we replaced L by N as well. So we get a bunch of cancellation. Anyway, this thing turns out to be equal to a Kronecker delta function times the length of the transform in this case. Um, let's take a look at uh, an example. Let's take a case where K naught is 25 and L, t L and N are both 100. And um, here is the, uh, a plot showing two different things. First on the top, we have in blue the discrete time Fourier transform. So remember this is a continuous function and um, it, it's a sync function. I mean that's what we calculated from up above. What we're looking at is a plot of this function, the magnitude of this function as a function of frequency. For frequencies between 0 and 1, you can see that here. And then the red lines or, or these red stem plots, these are the samples that we get by taking the DFT. So remember that these, the DFT is samples of the discrete time Fourier transform, and this is one of those special cases where the uh, samples fall on the zero crossings, and we get one sample right at the center of the main peak. So if we were just looking at the samples alone without seeing the discrete time Fourier transform underneath it, we would get this sequence. And notice it's a Kronecker delta sequence, just as expected. Amplitude is 100, because that's the length of the sequence. It's the length of the transform. And also, the frequency occurs at bin number 25, or the, the peak occurs at bin number 25. Um, on the frequency axis, that's at 25 over 100, which is frequency 1 fourth. Um, so the thing to remember is that when we uh, have a frequency, when we have a complex exponential whose frequency is one of these special bin center frequencies, we always get 
um, in the frequency domain, all of the energy concentrated into one frequency bin. Let's look at another case. In this case, uh, let's take the, and let the frequency be um, 25 plus 1 half. So this is no longer one of those special bin center frequencies. In fact, it's halfway in between. What this means is that the sync function, um, the DTFT, this blue function, um, is shifted just a little bit further to the right. But the samples of that function always appear at the same set of frequencies. So in this example, what's happened is we've shifted the function over. We're taking our samples at the same location. Um, but we get a very different looking DFT. So if you think about it, we made a very, very small change in the frequency. But we got a very big change in the DFT. So compare this picture, where we have a Kronecker delta, with this picture, where we have all of these you know, energy leaking out into all these other frequency bins. Here, all of, the, all of the energy was contained in a single frequency bin. We made a slight change in the frequency, and suddenly we have energy in all these other frequency bins. Um, this is just the nature of, of the game. And why does this happen? Well, we, we have to just keep in mind that the reason this is happening is that the underlying function, which again is the blue line, hasn't really changed between these two examples. What has happened is it has been shifted to the right slightly so that the samples now um, fall away from zero. Let's now look at another example. In this case, um, we're going to let uh, L be equal to a 100. So again, this is the same exact function that we were dealing with before. K is back equal to 25, but um, it is no longer a bin center frequency because the, whether we're a, we have a bin center frequency or not depends on the relationship between um, K and n, the length of the transform. Now, um, and, and so notice that the frequency here is k naught divided by L, which is um, 100. Uh, so in this, in this case, uh, there is zero padding in the time domain. And when we take the transform, uh, we get uh, 256 samples, again, because we're sampling 256 times across this frequency axis between 0 and 1. And uh, the function hasn't changed, but uh, the samples have changed. And so we get more samples falling at these points that we see here. And uh, if you take away the underlying DT DTFT and just look at the DFT, you get this set of samples here. Uh, one final example. Um, in this case, we let the frequency be 25 over 256. And um, again, the length of the sequence is 100. Um, so uh, the frequency is now about 1 tenth, because it's 25 over 256. Uh, but, the, but the underlying function hasn't changed. And so uh, we have more samples of the underlying function. Let's take a look now at some of these ideas in MATLAB. So in this example, I'm going to take an endpoint transform. So this is a 50-point transform. The length of my signal is 50. The frequency bin is going to be bin number 20. The frequency of my complex exponential will be uh, 20 over 50. That's a bin center frequency. This is my time domain signal. It's j e to the j 2 pi f naught. 0 to L minus 1. And then I take the DFT, an endpoint DFT, by calling the FFT function. The rest of this code is plotting code. And uh, you can see the results of this over here on the left. On the top, we see the time domain signal. Its real and imaginary parts are shown here in blue and orange. Uh, in the next uh, subfigure, we see the discrete time Fourier transform in orange and the DFT in blue. And then down below, you see the DFT uh, plotted against frequency bin index. So this frequency that we've selected here, f naught, 
which is an integer over the length of the transform and the length of the data. So I could just as easily have said here k naught divided by n, which is the length of the transform. The important thing here is that the, the frequency um, is, an, is a rational number, and the denominator is equal to the length of the transform. That's called a bin, a, a, a bin center frequency. And a complex exponential um, at the bin center frequency has all of its energy concentrated in one frequency bin. Uh, and you can see that uh, what we're doing here uh, is that the, this underlying sync function, which is the DTFT of a finite length complex exponential signal, um, is being sampled by the DFT at the zero crossings of the function and on the peak. So all of its energy is concentrated in this frequency. Um, the frequency is uh, 2 divided by 50. That's equal to the decimal value of 0.4. So we get all of the energy in that frequency bin. To illustrate what happens if we were to make a small change in the frequency, so now the frequency is 20.5. This is no longer a bin center frequency, but just a very small change in frequency. If we uh, run that code, we see that we get a very small change in the signal, but we get a big change in the shape of the, DT, the DFT. What has happened here is that the peak, or the center of this um, DTFT function, is, appears at the frequency um, F0. And so it's been shifted over a little bit from the last example, and the samples are still at the same location they were before. And so we're sampling this function at different locations. Um, instead of sampling at the zero crossings, we're sampling at these peak locations. And so we get a function that looks like this. So, the, so you can see that uh, these bin center frequencies um, are kind of special because they have all their energy concentrated into a single frequency bin. How many bin center frequencies are there? Well, there are, in this case, 50 different bin center frequencies. I could, uh, I could look at bin 21 and run that, and bin 22 or 23 and run that. You can see that in each case, the, um, the underlying DTFT is shifting over, but our samples are still falling at the zero crossings. That happens until we have some um, non-integer. Uh, non but if we go with an integer, which is a bin center frequency, then again, all the energy is concentrated into one frequency bin. Um, all right. Now, let's uh, run a few other little experiments here. Let's suppose that I change the length of the transform in this case, I'm going to go up to, say, 128. This is a power of 2. And um, notice that uh, if, if you look at the frequency, the frequency is k naught divided by L. You, you might think this is a bin center frequency, but it's not, because it's, um, th there's two things that need to happen. One is that it needs to be a, uh, a numerator is an integer, and the denominator is equal to the length of the transform. But we also need the, um, the data to have the length of the transform. So here, our data is still 50 samples in length, and then we zero pad out to 128. When we compute the transform of this, um, we get 128 samples of that same underlying function. Notice that the orange line here hasn't changed. Let's go back to 50, just to illustrate that. The orange line will not change. It's just that the number of samples that we're taking changes. So let's go back to 128. Um, so you can see here the relationship between zero padding and the sampling operation. The shape of the function is determined by the data. And in this case, we haven't changed the data. We've just zero padded. Zero padding just samples the same function at more points. If we change the length of the data also to 128, Notice that now this is a bin center frequency, 2 divided by 128. That's an integer divided by the length of the transform. 
So here, notice now that we have a full, um, our, our data window in the going into the transform has no zero padding, it's full, and uh, our frequency is a bin center frequency. So yeah, all of our energy is concentrated into one of the frequency bins here. That's true no matter what the uh, integer is. Again, if we were to change this frequency to an integer plus a half, or plus, even it doesn't have to be a half, plus some fraction, notice again that now we have this um, leakage occurring because the energy has been is spilling out into adjacent frequency bins. We don't have a frequency bin at 